Okay, folks, everyone hear me? Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm not used to speaking with a microphone. I normally shout at my students. It's more fun that way. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to try and talk to you today is give you a bit of a flavour of what a full pint of science talk is. So you know, the guys coming after could be much reduced. But I want to talk to you about chilli. So firstly, hands up, who likes hot food? Okay, you guys can stay. The rest of you got to leave. No, you can stay. That's fine. Uh, the next thing I want to ask you is a question. So what's this? Anyone? Yeah? Is it the thing that makes chilli spicy? Yeah, and what's that? You don't know, excellent. Any more? Any more ones? Anyone else? Capsicum. Capsicum? Capsicum, I said. Very good. No, it's plastic, I'm afraid. <laughs> excellent, very good. Now, I'm, I'm actually being unfair. This is a molecule we call capsaicin. Okay? As I go through my talk, we're going to talk a little bit more about what these are, but this is the main culprit for when you have spicy food, for when things get a little bit hot and spicy. Okay? And there you go. I'd like to use a little visual slides if we can. So you can see, nice hot chilies with Scoville ratings. I want to talk to you a little bit today about Scovilles. So why are chilies hot? And it really does come down to the presence of this, the presence of molecules like this. This is capsaicin. If you look at my chart behind me, you can see we've got two molecules. One's called dihydrocapsaicin. If I were to show you that molecule, you probably wouldn't recognize much difference. In actual fact, all it is, is two more white blobs on the end, okay? They're very, very closely related. And what actually happens in your body when we have capsaicin, when we eat it? What are the effects, guys? What happens? You get hot, you get sweaty, you get a taste, your mouth is burning. And what is the reason for that? Well, this is a bit of the science, okay? So what you can see, hopefully, behind me, the TRPV1 channel. Wow, that's fantastic. If you remember nothing else today, I want you to remember that and go and tell your friends and family. Okay, this is a receptor-type molecule. It's in our body. And what happens is, the capsaicin goes in and it performs a con trick. Because realistically, the TRPV1 isn't really bothered about capsaicin. It's not looking for this. It's not a natural thing. It's actually doing something else. It's detecting heat. But this molecule just happens to go into the receptor and fool the body into thinking something's really hot. So I'm sure you've heard of chili ice cream, haven't you? Anyone tried chili ice cream? No? What? You've tried it, Ed. What was it like? Did your mouth get hot or can't get cold? Yeah, but you also get the heat sensation, okay? So it's a bit of a contrast, and that's what's going on. Now, who's heard of the Scoville test? Excellent, good. I am actually looking for some volunteers today. I'm going to need volunteers to go do something incredibly dangerous. Now, unfortunately, I see a very keen young man there. Because of the way I've done this, I can't involve you in this test because we're using alcohol. Does that make it more attractive? I'm sure it does. Now, the alcohol we're going to use is not very concentrated, I'm afraid. What I want to do is a Scoville test. Now, Scoville is a man very dear to my heart. He was originally a pharmacist, and he was interested over 100 years ago in using chilies to treat diseases and treat conditions. And this is something that is still very current. So people actually look at the science of chilies now, and they are interested in using them to treat diseases. Okay? And I'll talk perhaps a little bit about that. But what Scoville did was something interesting. He didn't have access to multi-million pound equipment like I've got in my labs. He wanted to find out how hot a chili was. And how do you do that? Well, the very easy, obvious way is to taste it. Okay? But he did something rather clever. Rather than just taste it and rate it on the basis, oh my god, my mouth's burning, or that's not very hot, which is what I would do, he actually did something clever. He dried chilies, ground them up, and extracted them with alcohol. And then he did a series of dilutions. So what he does, as he goes through, he does a one-fold dilution, a ten-fold dilution, a hundred-fold dilution, a thousand-fold dilution. And then what you do, you use the very sensitive bit of equipment that he could lay his hands on, which was you guys. Because your mouth can actually detect things at incredibly low concentrations. So what we do, we get a panel of people together, and I'm hoping my minions are getting ready. We get a panel of people together, and then we taste our dilutions. And what you're looking to do is to see at what dilution you start to detect capsaicin. Okay, it's really important. So what I want to do now, can I have five victims? Sorry, volunteers. There's one there, she's very keen. Up you come. And you, sir. Three more volunteers. Hand it off you come. Fantastic. Two more volunteers. Two more volunteers. You must have a will in place to do this, I'm afraid. <coughs> Any more volunteers? Come on, let's have two more volunteers. Yeah, there you, sir. One of oh, you, sir. Yeah, it's very good. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, now... 
My volunteers are fishing out. I've got two chilies here, which I've dried, I've ground up, I've extracted with alcohol, and I've made my dilutions. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna start with the most dilute first. And the most dilute is basically water, with a bit of sugar and almost no flavor to it at all. And what happens is, my colleagues would go through the dilutions, and then when they reach a point at which they can start to detect some chili, they're gonna put their hands up. You listen to this, and you say, right, at that point you stop. And then when more than three of them, or more than two of them, I should say, have reached the point where they can detect it, that's the dilution that we're going to say are chili heaters. Okay. Now my bottle's coming, folks. Very good. We'll start with the Madre Vieja. Excellent. So if we've got an HD cover glass, fantastic. And what I want you to do, I'm going to leave my gophers to carry on doing this while I keep talking. Okay, folks. Are you all confident? How good are your taste buds? We've got any super tasters here? Any super tasters? My wife claims to be a super taster. She likes mashed potato, I don't bore it. Okay, super tasters are very good. Okay, folks. If you could start them with the most, uh, the least concentrated, Robin, then we'll keep on going through. So, we go back to the Scoville test. Does this remind you of anything? I'll go back, actually. We're doing dilutions. And as we do dilutions, the capsaicin gets less and less and less concentrated. And that should remind you of something, because there's a branch of medicine, I'm going to refer to it in inverted commas, called homeopathy. And what they do, they take a substance and they dilute it. And then they dilute it. And they do it again and again and again and again and again. And it gets more and more powerful if you believe them. Now, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, I am not a homeopath. I'm a scientist. And homeopathy, I'm afraid to say, is bollocks. <laughs> Excuse my language. Homeopathy is not very good. Okay, you have to be very, very careful. Homeopathy... If you believe it works for you, sir, that's fantastic. But it is no, not scientifically based. Does it, sir? Yeah. Could you prove it? It's energy medicine, and I have living proof. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't believe it works. There we are. Okay. How are we getting on, folks? Getting on here? One in 10,000. One in 10,000. Okay, folks. So we go. Remember, when you get to a hit, you put your mouth up. There we go. So what I want to talk to you today is a little bit about how we do testing. So... It's all very well to use my guinea pigs here, and they're going to test, they're going to give us a result. But if I want to do things in a modern setting, I tend to do something a little bit different. And normally for chilies, what we do, we do the same thing, we grind them up, we extract them, we do something called HPLC. Now HPLC is just like the chromatography you used to do at school with ink on a bit of blotting paper and water. Do you remember that? You get the different colours separate out. It's a way of separating things, and then we can quantify them. And we do HPLC. Now HPLC is very good for chilies. It's got one slight problem, it only looks for two compounds. Now my job at the university here involves nuclear magnetic resonance. Now hands up, who's, been an MRI, who's had an MRI? Yeah, quite a few people. As we go through time, more and more people. Did you enjoy the experience? You did, you didn't. Okay. I work with what's called nuclear magnetic resonance, and it's the same type of thing that you went into. When you went to the hospital, they didn't call it a nuclear MRI, did they? And why do you think that is? Because no one would go in the bloody things, that's why. Okay, so we actually do the same thing, but rather than stick a patient into a big donut, we do it into a sample. Okay, so don't worry about the data too much, this is just an example of me showing off how good my experiments are. I use NMR data rather than HPLC data, but you get a very good correlation. Now, go for this, how are we getting on? Anyone there? You've got two, at what level? One in a thousand, but we have one in a thousand. One in, so, okay, so you've reached one in a thousand. So the Madre VA here, folks, we're going to say one in a thousand. One in a thousand, okay. So what I want you to do now is to move on to the KT. I'm going to start at low and go up to high again, okay folks? So get yourselves ready. Very good. Okay, so I've talked to you a little about capsaicin. I said there's more than one capsaicin. So here we go, this is dihydrocapsaicin on my NMR. Don't worry about what the lines mean. Generally, on average, in most chilli sample, you get twice the amount of capsaicin, dihydrocapsaicin. But you also get other things there too. Okay? These little bits and pieces here are other capsaicinoids. Now, every chili out there will have more than two capsaicinoids. They're related compounds, and lots of them are there. Now, I have a theory that the different capsaicin molecules give different tastes. And one of the best theories I've heard is that dihydrocapsaicin, the lesser component, gives a longer-lasting burn in your mouth. So I'm sure some of you will have experienced a chili, which you eat it, and it's hot, but not particularly hot, but it stays forever. It goes burns and burns and burns. Other times, you'll have a chilli, you'll eat it, you think, oh, God, that's hot, and then it's gone. And I have a theory that it's related to the different hypercapsaicin words. 
So what we've been doing is we've been looking at them to see if we can work out again. And again, don't worry about this chart, but what we're looking at is the other presence of compounds in our chili. So the reason I use NMR, the nuclear magnetic resonance, rather than HPLC, is to look for different compounds. How are we going, folks? Are we getting there? Not yet? Okay, good. Fantastic. Okay. Here's a very quick snapshot of some chilies that are there. These are some of the other compounds, but it's probably more like 30 different compounds. Okay, and there you go. This is an example of some different chilies. Who's heard of Dorset Naga? Yeah, who's had Dorset Naga to eat? It's a vile experience, far too hot. Okay, but we've got also things called Lucy, oh, sorry, Lucky 7, KT, Capsizer, and they have different ratios of these compounds, and that's something that's very important in the taste characteristics. So there we go, that's how we get scopers. So, a couple of years ago, I became interested in why different capsaicinoids were formed in a chili. I was very interested to know why we get ratios, how hot they get, and what the point of it is. So if we look at this, the environment that a chili grows in will actually have a significant effect in capsaicinoid levels. And there was a paper published a while ago which said that if you expose a chili to drought, if you put the plant under stress or under water, what you will actually get uh, or temperature, or pretty so talking to them, another example of stress, you will actually get a change in the way the capsaicinoids accumulate in your chili fruit. So the implication of this paper was that if you starve your plant of water, it will get hotter fruit. Okay, so that made us start thinking, well, what other factors can you change in the way you grow your chilies to make your fruit hotter, if that's what you desire? And we decided we'd do an experiment where we grow the same chilies, but in different conditions. So they would either be having just water, so no nutrients. We would either be stressing the plants. And one way to stress the plant is to act to stimulate predation. So the idea is if you damage a plant, it thinks it's being attacked by insects or something, it might then produce a greater response yeah. to capsaicin. So we set up a whole load of control experiments and we went and looked at it. We had three different varieties, and we're actually testing two of these varieties here. One is the habanero, another is the Madre Vieja, and then we have Katie. Now, Katie is an interesting story. About two, three years ago, I started looking at chilies, and, and I needed some chilies to test because I've got a lovely machine, I need to actually test chilies. So what do I do? I think, I know, I'll get in touch with a local guy that I know who grows chilies for seeds. That's what my wife suggested to me. So why don't you give Matt a ring? So I thought, okay, I'll give Matt a ring. Have you got any chilies that I can test? Yes, I've got loads. Why don't you come over? So I went over there Saturday morning and he said, right, here we go. We went through all these greenhouses. I left with 80 different samples. I was thinking about eight. 80 different samples. We went through. It was fantastic. As part of the experience, I learned something very important about public engagement. And this is what we're doing today. You have to be very careful what you tell people who aren't scientists. Okay, scientists have a kind of unwritten code. We know what we're talking about if I say something. If I say to a scientist, it's a provisional result, they'll go, oh, that's interesting, and then they'll file it away. If I tell someone who grows chilies for a living and he's really interested in making the world's hottest chili, we've done a quick measurement on one of your chilies, Matt, and it's really hot. It's about this many level scovilles. And he goes, ah, fantastic. And he went away to a Dorset festival and he told a local newspaper and he said, I've got the UK's hottest chilli. <laughs> and that was fine, as far as it went, the Dorset local courier, the Bridport News, I'm not sure where it was. Suddenly, the Daily Mail picked up on this, because they obviously scan local newspapers for news, because that's the way you do news nowadays. And it was in the Daily Mail. And then, and I tell you, this is absolutely true, the BBC picked up on it, because that's how the BBC do their news, they read the Daily Mail. <laughs> this is absolutely true story. So there I was, I was in my office and the phone rang and I thought, oh God, it's, it's Matt. Tim, I'm, you might be getting a phone call from BBC Breakfast News in a minute. I'm thinking, oh God, what, what, what's going on? Um, I was talking about the chilies and, and this, and, and it went on. Anyway, so I had BBC Breakfast News begging with me to come on TV to talk about the chilies, which was fine, but they wanted me there at six o'clock, which is not a particularly good start. So the take home message, folks, is when you're talking to people, think who you're talking to and make sure you give the right message. Okay, how are we getting on, folks? And what was the level? One in a thousand. A little bit of that. Well, that's very disappointing because, in theory, the second one should have been tested a lot better. Now, this is why we don't use guinea pigs for doing these kind of testing now, and we use computer technology. Folks, thank you very much for taking part. There are some sheets in here. Because you've, because you've taken part in our test, we're going to give you free entry to our Chili Festival happening in July. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves.
Thank you very much. Okay. Just a quick view of our greenhouse when we did the experiments. What have we found? Well, not surprisingly, if you don't feed plants, they don't do very well. So they started out growing okay, then they tailed away. But what was really interesting is there are actually some differences in the fruits. Okay? But what we did find, and this was interesting, is that some types of chili behave differently to others. So some of them, if you start them with nutrients, they will get hotter, some of them will get less heat. And it's obviously a very, very complex situation. So what we'd like to do is to proceed this on a, on a greater basis. Now, I did promise I'd talk a little bit about the chilies themselves. Now, if you've had a hot chili and you want to get rid of the taste of that chili, what do you do? What's the best way? Yep. Eat ice cream. Eat ice cream, that's not a bad option, yes? Yogurt, that's a pretty good answer. Is no one going to say beer? Who's going to say beer? I thought I'd say beer. I'm going to say beer. Drink beer. Beer, thank you very much. Beer is actually really rubbish. Now, I want you to talk, and I'll show you what the is. Okay, this is my capsaicin molecule again. It's got two most important parts. This is the head unit. This is the tail. If I chop this off, this effectively is like oil. Okay? So if you've got a hot chili in your mouth and you want to get rid of it and it's hurting, the best thing you can do is go for the olive oil, swirl it around and spit it out. Genuinely true. But nobody wants to do that because it's horrible, do they? Okay, so what you should do in actual fact is get something like milk, because milk is an emulsion. Milk is an emulsion already, so that means that the molecules of oil will remove this from your mouth and it will stop the suffering at that little point. Now, speaking of suffering, I've got one last thing that I'm... Are you suffering, madam? I am, yeah. You're suffering, excellent. Yes. Give it time, it will fade, I promise you. If it doesn't fade, go and see your doctor, but don't take my name in vain. I came with coffee. Coffee is good. <laughs> so what I'm looking for you now, folks, to wrap everything up today, I need a couple of volunteers. And these need to be hardy individuals that are not afraid of a bit of pain, with the prospects of winning something. They need to be tough, they need to be brave, and they need to be not be afraid of chilies. Do I have some volunteers? You, sir, you'll be a volunteer. I need one more volunteer. I'm afraid I'm looking for the older gentlemen or ladies, I'm afraid. Yes, you, sir, fantastic. My God, I didn't think we'd get anyone for this. This is crazy. Oh my god. Sir, have you made a will? You have made you have made a will. Have you never made You haven't yet. Have you made a will? Fantastic, good. Now, is there anyone from a health and safety background here? Yeah, could you leave? No, that's fine. So gentlemen, what we're gonna ask you to do now, we have some water available for you. We have some chilies available for you. I'm gonna ask you both to eat a chili and not to swallow it for about 10-15 seconds, then you can swallow it. And then I want you to see how long you can go without taking a drink. Robin, can you get the chilies out for me, please? Now, we always do this because everyone likes seeing everyone else suffer. I never do this, I'm not stupid, but there we go. So there we go. So, you, yes, use the red one, that's fine. Okay, folks, so while these guys suffer, I'm going to open the floor for any questions. People often have questions for you. If you've got any questions, please let me know, and we'll get these guys eating, you can watch them suffer. So, any questions, folks? Yes? What's the point? Okay, so I did not really touch on it today, but there is medical evidence that eating chilies and the, the active compounds within them can help health. So one paper I'm very interested in is if you eat capsaicin and you combine it with medium chain triglycerides, you can lower your blood pressure. And capsaicin also acts to do something called thermogenesis. That's actually making your metabolism burn that a little bit faster, so maybe you can help lose weight. So it's very difficult. All dietary studies are dangerous. Come on, eat him, eat him, chew, keep going, eat him, chew. I hope these are hot enough, they might not be. All, um, all dietary studies are very difficult, and if you read the Daily Mail, which I don't encourage you to, I'm not an advert for them, I promise, but if you do read the Daily Mail, you'll see a study every week which tells you coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you, red wine's good for you, red wine's bad for you. It's very difficult to know what the truth is. And the same is true when we look at this kind of research. So what I'm hoping to do is to actually isolate a lot of these compounds, and when we do individual cell work, we look at particular disease pathways and see if we can use them to do things. Okay? And why do you get immune to it? Like, if you have a lot of chilies in your diet all the time, you just get used to that. What's going on there? The body actually adapts. So, effectively, like anything else, the body will adapt to certain stimuli. And if you keep taking chilies, you get hot. So, you probably all know you'll have a friend who eats hot chilies all the time. When he goes to the Indian restaurant or whatever, he says, I want hot chilies. And no, I want hotter than that. I have a friend in particular just like that. And he actually said, No, put some knobs and just chop it on like a bit of grated cheese. And that's where we go. Folks, how are we doing? Are you very robust? Is it hurting at all? Yeah. Excellent. But you're not going to take a drink. Right, next chili. Come on, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Yes, that's right. Couldn't you just study 
Yes, yes, you can. Is it, who's entering? We, we have a winner! Yeah. Winner! Yeah. Well done. Thanks so much, guys. Okay, so they're going to get an interesting thing. Yeah, no, so basically, yes, and that's where some of the evidence comes from. So in cultures where chilies are very prevalent, they actually have lower diabetes and lower blood pressure, or the general rule. Now, there may be other factors. It's always very, very complicated. It's always very complicated. Any more questions, folks? Yes? Yeah, no. So you can actually heat capsaicin really quite hot in your cooking pan, it will still be there. And one of the, one of the worst ways to cook um, chilies is to chop it up, put it in your frying pan, because what happens is you volatilize all the oils, gets into your eyes and into your lungs, and you then leave the kitchen going, oh my God, what have I done? So it won't affect, it's actually quite stable. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's the same thing. It's the same kind of reception that's going on in your mouth, just in your eyes. Yes. What I would say to do, don't rub your eyes. It's the easiest way to do it. In all seriousness, it is a dangerous thing. And the hotter the chili you're dealing with is, the worse it gets. So you chop it up on your chopping board, you walk away for a day, you can actually still come back next day, and it's still there. And the number of incidents I've had with chilies while I'm cooking or I'm preparing them, every time I have students in the lab and I say, right, chop these chilies up and then dry them out, inevitably one of them will come back and say, oh no, I've done that. And in fact, a couple of years ago, we had to evacuate the lab because they ground up some chilies, but they hadn't done it in a fume cover, they did it on the open bench, opened it up, and the dust went everywhere. And everyone starts, oh my eyes, so what's it? And I sort of left the building and hoped that no one noticed not me slinking away, effectively. So there we go. I've got one last little anecdote to, uh, to wrap things up, which is the danger again of communication. My mother-in-law is a lovely lady, but she's no scientist. And that's why she also likes a drink. Not excessively, but she likes it. One night she rang me up and she said, What is it you doing? I'm putting on the app, that's what she sounds like. What is it you doing? And something about bottoms. And I'm thinking, What on earth is she talking about? Very mind, you know, she's a bit drunk. I'm thinking, Bottoms. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to my friend. Something about bottoms. What is it you doing again? You told me. And I'm racking my brains, racking my. And then I said, I'm an NMR spectroscopist. He said, yeah, that's right, enemas, that's what you do, isn't it? <laughs> I said, no, NMR, what do you do? What do you do? Thanks very much, folks. It's been a great audience. Thank you.